The God of the Bible hates child sacrifice. Usually. He hates it when you sacrifice children to other gods instead of him. Evidently, he can only smell the pleasing aroma if it's addressed to him. I mean, opening someone else's mail is a felony after all, and a perfectly moral God would never dream of breaking the law. God is morally perfect. So instead, God just commands his favorite people, the Israelites, to commit genocide on any tribe that sacrifices children to other gods. He figures if he can kill all of those children first, then there won't be any left to sacrifice. And just to be safe, God also kills all the men, women, and livestock. But not the trees. You gotta save the trees. But there was one occasion where God allowed, accepted, and perhaps even orchestrated a child sacrifice in his name. And this child was called Jephthah's daughter. Now, women don't usually get name dropped in the Bible because they're not that important. So who is Jephthah? Jephthah is kind of like a cross between Jon Snow and Stannis Baratheon. He's a great warrior and a fearless leader, but he's a bastard. You're a bastard, Jon Snow. His father had sex with a prostitute, and all of his father's legitimate children hated him so much that they drove him out of the house and into the land of Tob, where he became the leader of a gang of scoundrels. There's a time skip here in the narrative, which is a shame, because I really would have enjoyed a story about these scoundrels getting into shenanigans. We gotta call 911! Dude, you're seriously overreacting! <laughs> now, Israel is at war with the Ammonites, and Jephthah's siblings come and visit him in the land of Tob with a proposal. Come, they said, be our commander so that we can fight the Ammonites. And Jephthah is understandably skeptical, and he's like, didn't you guys hate me last time you saw me, and now you want my help? But his family sweetens the deal and promises to make him leader of their house after the war. On God. Jephthah accepts the offer. You son of a bitch, I'm in. And then has an exchange with the Ammonite king about why the war is going on in the first place. Stay out of my territory. Whoever started the war is kind of beside the point. What happens next is the important part. The Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. Is this like how the Spirit of the Lord came in the Virgin Mary? Well, apparently so, because it gave Jephthah the motivation he needed to march on Ammon. And this is where Jephthah makes his infamous vow. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. It's a negotiation. Help me kill people, and in return, I will kill someone. For you. Now, it's not uncommon that this God can be negotiated with. And that happens all the time in the Bible. Abraham convinces God not to commit genocide on Sodom for a few hours. And Moses has to constantly remind God about his promise to not commit genocide on the Israelites. Now, usually it's a human trying to persuade God to not commit genocide. But this time, it's a human trying to get God's help with a genocide. Now, one interesting note here is that God never verbally accepts the offer, but he still holds up his end of the bargain. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. I wonder how God did this exactly. Did he rain hellfire down from the sky on the Ammonite soldiers right before battle began? Or maybe he tied their shoelaces together when they weren't looking. Either way, Jephthah didn't just win the war, he won only because God rigged it in his favor. It kind of reminds me of when God helps certain teams win football games. I ran around, my QB gave me a great throw. God took care of the rest, he watched the play. A guy ran into another guy. I give all the glory to God, I give him the praise on this great Sunday. He devastated 20 towns from Aroer to the vicinity of Mineth, as far as Abel Karimim 
Thus, Israel subdued Ammon. So not just soldiers. God helped them kill women and children in their homes too. How wholesome. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter! You have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. It's hard to feel any sympathy for Jephthah. I mean, who the hell do you expect to walk out of your house? He should have promised to kill whoever came out of his neighbor's house. And this would be a perfect opportunity for God to come down and say, Jephthah, your devotion to me is all the payment I need. Let your daughter live and go sacrifice a goat instead. But does God do that? Of course not. And Jephthah doesn't want to kill his daughter, but he's convinced he has to because that's what God wants. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. Two fucking months, and God doesn't intervene? God stopped Abraham from stabbing Isaac right at the last second, but no such intervention for Jephthah's daughter. If God didn't want it to happen, it's his responsibility to say so. God's silence is his endorsement. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed. And she was a virgin. I, I like that little disclaimer at the end, just in case we think that she might have gotten freaky with her friends in the woods during those two months. Because everyone knows non-virgins aren't worth as much, and therefore wouldn't make as good of a sacrifice. Now, how did the authors even know she was a virgin? Well, I guess the same way they know any of this stuff. God violated their free will to write down exactly what he wanted. How many times do you think Jephthah stabbed his daughter? 60. Once for every day that God could have stopped it but chose not to. Or maybe he just burned her alive. I mean, God probably likes the screams just as much as he likes the smell. So what's the moral of the story? I have no idea, but the best I can come up with is don't make promises that you don't want to keep. Were vows wrong? You know, was Jephthah's vow a mistake that he made a vow to God? No, vows aren't wrong. They're not wrong in the Old Testament. They're not wrong in the New Testament. They're found throughout Scripture. Deuteronomy 23.10, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it. In other words, you make a vow, you do the vow you make. But why are we supposed to keep promises if they violate God's commands? He supposedly doesn't like child sacrifice, right? It would be like if I made a vow to God, help me win this football game, and in return, I'll bomb the first church I see. You're telling me God would rather me blow up a church than go back on my word? We're supposed to believe promises must be kept even when not a single party involved wants them to be. Jephthah didn't want to kill his daughter. His daughter, although weirdly down for it, still mourned her death. And that just leaves God. If God didn't want Jephthah's daughter to die, he would have stopped it. Which means God wanted Jephthah to sacrifice his daughter. And always remember, God knew she would die all along and went along with it anyway. This whole story takes place in Judges 11, which is only a couple of pages before Samson lights 300 foxes on fire. Check out this video if you want to learn more about that. And always remember, it's okay to question your beliefs because the truth has nothing to fear from investigation. Thanks for watching.